This morning's second reading is one of my favorite readings that appears during our celebration of the season of Christmas, because it's that moment when a story that began in a small place with just a handful of people becomes a moment that is extended to the whole world and to all people as people start to see and respond to this great revelation of God's love in Jesus Christ. So let us listen together for this wonderful moment from the Gospel of Matthew, the second chapter, beginning with verse 1. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. And they asked, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star its rising, and we have come to pay him homage. Now when King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him. And so calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he asked of them where this Messiah was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, You, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time that the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I too may go and pay him homage. When they heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and they paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Well, believe it or not, friends, another, another season of giving and receiving gifts has come to an end. All the presents have been unwrapped, the returns have made, and if we couldn't return it, it's on a shelf waiting to be re-gifted next year, right? Which is a good thing because we all have those people in our lives that are just ridiculously difficult to buy gifts for, yes? You just can't shop for them. So if you're looking for an early jump on next year's Christmas, i got to let you in on some real doozies that I saw online this week that will be perfect for the hard-to-shop person in your life. I saw a magic wand programmable television remote control, yes? Got Harry Potter fans in your life? Uh, Samuel's family? Yes? You can wave the magic wand and it will change the channel of the TV. (laughs) $79.99. Or, if that doesn't do it for you, you can actually purchase right now today one acre on the planet of Mars from the Lunar Federation Company for $29.99. Think that's for real? (laughs) But it's online, and you can buy it. comes with a complete kit, certificate. You've got land on Mars. And of course, then, there is my favorite selling on Amazon right now, the Golden Girls Chia Pet. (laughs) And you can have your pick of any of the Golden Girls for $19.99. So there you go. A little few gifts to jumpstart the, the coming year, especially for those in your life who are difficult to shop for. But when it comes to people difficult to shop for, can you imagine how challenging it would be to buy a present for Jesus Christ? Hmm? Now, if you look at the whole of Scripture, there's not a lot of places where people actually had the audacity or the bravery to buy or to give a gift to Jesus Christ. There is a moment in the Gospel of Luke when a woman came to Jesus as he was eating at a table And she fell to her knees and she broke open this beautiful alabaster jar of perfume and wiped his feet with the perfume and her tears. And the disciples got mad at her. Remember that moment? 
There's a similar story in the Gospel of John where Mary, the sister of Martha, again sits at Jesus' feet and she gives him this expensive uh, ointment to wipe his feet. And in both cases, people resented these gifts. They got angry that something so precious was wasted in their eyes on Jesus. And then there's that time in the Gospels where the disciples and Jesus are looking to feed a great multitude of people And a young child gives them five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus uses that gift to feed thousands. And the only other place that I came across was at the end of Jesus' life and ministry when Jesus is given the gift of a colt, a donkey, to ride into the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Beyond this, there's not a lot of gifts that we find in Scripture that were given to Jesus Christ, at least Nothing that we'd be overly excited about giving or receiving on Christmas morning. Well, friends, Jesus wasn't given much by many. And yet today, in the scripture that we share each and every year in the season of Epiphany, we find the story of the wise men or the magi. And we find here what might be the most insightful and meaningful gifts ever given to Jesus. Gifts that show us not only who God is for us, but who God wants us to be in return. And it doesn't even require going online to find that difficult gift. Now, friends, these wise men, these magi, are folks that came from the East. That's all we know in Scripture. But they probably, we think, came about two years or so after the birth of Jesus Christ. So he's no longer the little child wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. He and his family have gone on from that place. They've moved it back into their home, and the Magi arrive. We think they were astrologers, astronomers, or physicians. We think they were high-ranking government officials, people whose wisdom and knowledge, whose influence made them among the very best of the best of their time. Some of the most well-educated people of their day and age. But even with all that status, that wealth, that power, that influence, still these wise men, these magi, were, were looking, were searching, were seeking something more. They were perhaps like many of us today. People who know a great deal about many things but still have some part of us that feels empty, that longs for something greater, having so much but missing something bigger, knowing many people but missing that one relationship that leaves us eternally fulfilled, still waiting, searching, and longing for something more. If that's you, then this is a good day because into your story, into our story, into our season of worship come these magi. And with them come these gifts that we have grown so accustomed to singing about, but gifts of the wise who show us just how wise we can be today. I think the most important thing that I learn and that we can learn from these wise men that come from the East is that first and foremost in their lives, they came not just to give gifts to Jesus, right? But before they gave those gifts, what did they do? It says in Scripture, they paid him what? Homage. Homage. What does that mean? I honored him. They worshipped him. They fell to their knees and they worshipped. They came a great distance, traveled for months or years to first and foremost worship Jesus Christ. And so many people today still struggle with this idea of what it means to worship, to to be together as a family of faith, to pray, to to read scripture, to, to do the things that we are expected to do and never feel like we've really worshiped. See, friends, the wise men, the magi, treasured this young child they were coming to visit, so they worshiped that thing or that person that they treasured the most. Remember, rich and powerful, wealthy and wise people, friends to the powerful, keepers of the greatest knowledge of their time, and here they are in a little town in the middle of nowhere on their knees in the dirt worshiping a two-year-old child. Friends, if we treasure something in our lives, whatever that something is, if we truly treasure something in our lives, we will worship it. 
The struggle, friends, is that sometimes the things that we treasure most are not always the same as the things God would have us treasure most. We all have people in our lives that we would do anything for, yes? But will we go to the same ends for the God we love? We've all been in those moments where we get up at the crack of dawn or before the crack of dawn to travel on a great, exciting vacation, yes? There's people in my neighborhood, God help them all, who get up and walk or run before the sun even comes out, right? You see them out there biking, fishing, or attending sporting events, but then we say, oh man, 10 a.m. for worship on a Sunday? Oh, that's just too early. We need to rest. But friends, these wise men worshipped. They stopped at nothing to worship, despite the great distance that separated them from the Christ. It took them roughly two years to get there to Jerusalem, traveling from modern-day Iran or Iraq, hundreds of miles in the desert, on camels or on foot, and all God asked for us is to, I don't know, get in a car and travel two, three, four, five minutes, maybe more. But for the wise men, that challenge, that effort just to find the Christ child, can you imagine following a star across the desert for two years? Leaving your home, leaving friends and family to follow a star, hoping that something wonderful was at the end of that journey? The watchful and paranoid eyes of King Herod hovering over your journey like this ominous presence, and yet despite all that difficulty and danger, the wise men did not stop until they found him, but then worshipped him. So the gifts of the wise teach us to worship what we treasure. But the gifts of the wise also teach us another almost opposite truth, and that is to give our treasure, right, to the one that we worship. Because we got, they paid homage, and then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Friends, if we worship what we treasure, then we can't help but to do that second aspect as well, then that is to give our treasure to that which we worship. We're reminded each Christmas season that a good gift for a loved one is not something that we run out and buy the day before in the hustle and bustle of the holiday season, right? A good gift for someone that we love and care about is personal and meaningful. It's something that takes into consideration who it is that we are giving this gift to. And most good gifts cost something of us, something of who we are or what we have. See, friends, the wise men knew what to give because they knew who they were giving that gift to. Their gifts had meaning and purpose and significance. Remember the first gift, gold. Now, we know gold, the most precious metal of the day, a gift fit for the mightiest king, symbolic of royalty, power, and influence. Friends, when the wise men worshipped Jesus and gave him that gift of gold, they were announcing his place in the world as a king among all kings, the one foretold through prophecies and prophets. The gift of gold is an invitation for us still today to give something of ourselves to God that is costly and valuable, to ask ourselves if we've given everything we can to God and God's work among us. Have we given the most costly and valuable place of our lives, the gifts of our hearts, our minds, our bodies, and spirits? our time, our talent, and our treasure, have we given something that cost something of us? The child in the manger, the great king of kings, the lord of lords, the one who will not stay there, but who will go on to teach us new ways of living and loving God, the one who will die and rise again, as our faith in who he is, not just at the season of Christmas, but throughout all of his life and ours, has our faith cost us anything of significance? Friends, the gifts of the wise were not only gold, but also the gift of frankincense, something we know maybe a little bit less about, but it's a gift fit for a priest. You see, frankincense was a fragrant resin that was taken from trees in Arabia, And they took that resin and they used it to make oil for use in the temple. 
And it was the priests who at that time made the sacrifices on behalf of the people of God. And when they did this two, three, maybe four times a day, that smell of that oil burning, that smell of frankincense would cover the priest. It would get into his clothes and his skin. That smell would go with him wherever he went so that everybody knew what it was he had done that day. Put it another way, have you ever sat around a campfire? Anybody? Yep. Now when you tend to spend some time sitting around a campfire and the fire finally goes down and you leave, what do you smell like? The campfire. They, people know where you were because they can smell that on you. It gets into who you are, your clothes, your skin, your hair. Friends, when we live our lives as children of God and Jesus Christ, when we walk in his footsteps and we live by his examples, when we really live the way God has called us to live, that aroma of who he is, it gets down into us, deep down inside of us. It becomes part of who we are so that as we go out, our words, our thoughts, our actions, who we are, show the world that we are his disciples, that aroma, that vision, that scent of Jesus Christ goes before us and behind us and among us and it reveals to others that we are one of his disciples. And finally, friends, the gifts of the wise included this strange and odd thing called myrrh. You know anything about myrrh? Myrrh was a gift fit for a great sacrifice because myrrh was a was a gooey, gum-like substance that came from trees in Saudi Arabia. A rich and fragrant spice that was used to embalm the dead. Great gift for a child, yes? Imagine going to the hospital of a young couple who has just had a baby and giving them the gift of a prepaid funeral for their child <laughs> at some point in the future. But that's exactly what the wise men did. They worshipped him as the one foretold in prophecies who would die for their sins. That gift of myrrh reminds us that the child we celebrate each Christmas, the one born in humility to Mary and Joseph, is the very same person who will stretch his arms out in love and give his life on the cross, only to rise again, so that all who believe may know the freely given gift of life eternal. Those are pretty good gifts because the gifts of the wise, those gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, those costly and meaningful gifts point us to the truth of who Jesus Christ is in our world, in our lives, in our hearts, in our faith, and who we ought to be in return. That gift of worshiping what we treasure and giving our treasure to what we worship are gifts that easily extend into all of our lives, gifts that if we take them seriously, friends, can profoundly affect the way we live our lives and the way we give to God's work among us. If only we could follow the example of these wise men, these magi that we celebrate each year, if only we could see the revelation that they saw in our lives and respond accordingly, if only we too can worship what we treasure and give our treasure to the one who alone is worthy of our treasure. Imagine, friends, what a fabulous new year this could be. Thanks be to God. Amen.